Good morning, and welcome to today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops. We're happy that you joined us for today's session, uh, the, which is uh, primarily uh, dedicated to stand establishment for corn and soybean. These sessions are brought to you by the University of Minnesota Extension and the generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, along with the Minnesota Corn Growers Research and Promotion Council. I'm Dave Nikolai. I'm the Regional Extension Educator in Crops. Uh, we welcome our speakers today and panelists, Dr. Seth Nave and Dr. Jeff Coulter from the University of Minnesota Extension. But before we get started, just a few housekeeping things we'd like to mention. These sessions are meant to be more of a discussion type format. Uh, we'll have some time at the beginning for some introductory material uh, from the various panelists uh, and, and uh, talk about some of those things. And at, at that point in time, we'll have an opportunity for them to uh, present their material and to have some general uh, discussion in terms of format uh, from the audience. Uh, the discussion will include questions that were submitted prior to this event, uh, but we'll also have an opportunity for you, the audience, uh, to submit questions as well. Uh, on the bottom of your screen or Zoom, if you are familiar with it, if you're not, you can hover your mouse over that area, you'll find a box that says Q&A or question and answer. And that is where you can enter in a question. Uh, make sure that you type or you hit the enter key when you're done uh, typing in your question and so that we can receive that and relay that to the speakers for the uh, uh, seminar today. Uh, if you have mechanical issues or concerns about uh, receiving uh, the information clearly or there's a computer situation, uh, please put that in the chat box. But in terms of the questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A box. Again, it's a bar at the bottom of your screen and uh, you may need to exit the full screen in order for that to appear, uh, but you'll find it at the list of that at the bottom. Each session today is being uh, recorded as it has been in the past, and we'll make that available in approximately a week. At the conclusion of today's uh, presentation, you'll be receiving a short three question survey. And uh, because this is the last session for our winter spring season, we're gonna be sending out a more comprehensive survey within uh, the next day or so uh, and hopefully get a lot of input from uh, audience members that have had a chance to participate not only in today, but in previous uh, sessions uh, with that. So those are the uh, essential things that I wanted to talk briefly uh, about, and we'll talk more about some of our plans for uh, more types of formats for this in the spring and the summer uh, later on in the program. Uh, with that, I'm just going to start off and share a couple of images that just came through uh, from our friends at the USDA. And this has to do with the uh, USDA Midwest Climate Hub, the forecast um, as of this past week in terms of drought, as well as in situations dealing with the forecast for the month of uh, April. Uh, many of you are well aware of, obviously, by looking out your windows this, uh, this morning or listening to the local forecast, we are receiving rain. Uh, we have received rain uh, previously and, and yesterday, et, et cetera. Uh, this is the uh, previous, for the month of March, the USDA North Central Drought Monitor. And uh, the image indicates that primarily for a lot of Minnesota, we were abnormally dry up until this point. But we do have some areas of Western Minnesota and Northwestern Minnesota, according to the Drought Monitor, that have been uh, up until today and probably going forward listed as a moderate drought situation with that. So. Again, we are receiving rain, but we still have a ways to go in terms of the profile. Uh, the uh, Midwest Climate Hub also sent out their predictions and their probability for the month of April uh, in terms of temperature. And if we take a look at the map, certainly South Dakota and Iowa, Nebraska and so forth and areas on South are gonna be uh, situations where we have uh, different in terms of uh, temperature, but we will be looking at uh, primarily uh, a good opportunity for a lot of these areas uh, to have some temperature uh, uh, probabilities. And it all it indicates um, by the letters and so forth, of course, north of us, but uh, down, uh, down below the B indicates will be below normal in the, in the Northwest. Uh, but the other areas of the United States will be um, above and, and beyond that in terms of temperature probabilities uh, for the month of April. Uh, the precipitation, um, forecast for the month of April does indicate equal chances uh, for moisture across the upper Midwest. Uh, but if we look in, in, at the 
precipitation scheme, uh, we're looking at below opportunities uh, primarily for the Western US and for the Southeastern part of the United States. If we sum it up in terms of the outlook for uh, the month of April uh, indicates that we're looking at likely warmer conditions throughout the region, a slight chance of drier into the plains uh, that generally would be good for row crops, warming the soils and allowing for planting progress. So the chances of getting too much uh, more moisture back in the soils seem less likely uh, and all depends upon what rainfall we do have in April. Uh, the spring outlook is mostly similar uh, beyond April, but with some increased chances for precipitation in the Eastern uh, Corn Belt uh, lakes. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and right now, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Jeff Coulter, uh, University of Minnesota Extension uh, Corn Specialist and uh, give us a little bit of an update on some of the uh, uh, images and concerns that he has for stand establishment in corn. Okay, thanks Dave. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today. And I'd like to begin about just discussing planting date in corn. So this slide shows the result of 26 planting date trials that have been conducted across Minnesota from 2009 to 2016. And in each one of these trials, there were at least four planting dates. And in this table, the left column shows the different planting dates. And we had four to six planting dates per trial. And I broke the planting dates down in this left column uh, so that we could look at the effects of yield. And the middle column is grain yield represented as a percent of the maximum. And the right hand column is the number of growing degree days that have been accumulated since the first available planting date. And if we look at this data, what we see is that a planting date between April 25 and May 12 produced the highest yield on average. And with a, that planting date, the number of growing degree days that had accumulated up to that planting date was between 31 and 137. Now, if we look a little further uh, for a May 13 to May 19 planting date, now we see that the yield on average was reduced by two to 3% and the number of growing degree days that had accumulated up to that point was between 146 to 208 growing degree days. So thus, based on this information, we can expect no yield loss until planting is delayed until there has been at least 140 growing degree days accumulated since the first available planting date. And beyond a planting date of May 13 to May 19, the yield really starts to drop off quickly. Um, yeah, so uh, that's kind of what we see there for, um, for planting date effect. And as based on this information, we can conclude that there's many other factors other than planting date that are more important for yield. On the previous slide, we only saw a few percentage yield decline if planting was delayed until mid-May or a little further. Another thing to think about with planting date is that for germination, seeds need to imbibe 30% of their weight in water and the soil temperature needs to be at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And the issue with this is that the imbibition of water occurs regardless of the soil temperature. So if we plant corn right now, uh, the seeds would swell, but they wouldn't start to germinate until the soil temp gets to at least 50 degrees and that can cause uh, risk. Another thing that is an issue that's we should be thinking about are the weather conditions within one to two days after planting. One thing that can happen is that we can get this imbibitional chilling injury as indicated by these two pictures on the lower right hand corner. And that can occur when soil temperature drops to 40 degrees or less within one to two days after planting. Based on this information, we can, it, it's important to consider the expected weather and soil temperature during the one to two days after planting. In addition, Within reason, a good general guideline is to begin planting as soon as the soil conditions are suitable and generally not earlier than April 18. When we plant earlier than April 18, there's greater risk of corn being susceptible to frost in, in May and getting damaged by that. In addition, we can also um, have that corn sitting in the ground longer before emergence. Uh, and based on the planting date table, we see that there's generally no yield loss due to delayed planting until at least 140 growing degree days have accumulated since the first available planting date. 
In addition, it's a, important to avoid planting when soils are too wet. Uh, advantages to early planting can be negated if pre-plant tillage and planting occur when the soils are too wet. Another thing to look out for is uneven emergence. For corn, it's very important for all of the plants to emerge at the same time. If we have unevenness in emergence, that's going to affect yield. A plant that is one leaf stage behind the other plants is only gonna yield about 80% of what it normally would. In comparison, a plant that is very late to emerge and is, ends up being two leaf stages behind the other plants early in the season will only yield about half of what it normally would. So when we think about emergence and trying to get uniform emergence, there's basically four key requirements. The first one is adequate and uniform moisture in the seed zone. Another is adequate and uniform seed to soil contact. A third is adequate and uniform temperature in the seed zone. And the fourth one is lack of soil crust and soil compaction near the seed. And uneven moisture in the seed zone is the number one cause of uneven emergence. That can be the result of variable soil conditions, tillage and residue patterns, or uneven depth of seed placement. And in general, a two inch planting depth helps to achieve adequate and uniform moisture in the seed zone and seed to soil contact. It also helps with successful nodal root establishment. So with that, that's everything that I have to share and I will turn it over to Seth Nave. Very good, Jeff, thank you. Let me see if I can share. Okay, um, I hadn't actually, pre um, I hadn't planned on presenting any um, data or any figures to start off with. I thought we could jump right into a conversation, but I, Jeff had some really nice uh, discussions around planning data. And I think let's continue on with soybean and do a little contrast or, or comparison with soybean. Um, first, let's uh, think about changes in uh, response over time. I think that's a big question we have we might have is how has our changing environment really affected this planting date? Certainly farmers are planting earlier. We know that from USDA records. Uh, but what is the yield response uh, to this? And so this is, some, this is a summary of, of a number of classical uh, planting date studies in soybean. And basically, um, these folks all the way starting in, in 1981, all the way through uh, an Iowa study this last year, have basically shown the same exact thing. We have about two thirds of a percent uh, decline in yield potential after about May 20. Uh, but that initial, um, an initial planning date response in, you know, between late April and uh, through the middle of May is really pretty flat. I think a lot of folks might argue that we don't have enough really early data here to show what the early side of this is. And I would agree that um, these, these, uh, these studies are really challenging to get out early. And I think in order to get really the early data, we'd have to have a large number of, of, uh, of years to go into that data set. So that's why I really like showing this data from Bruce Potter and Steve Queering and, uh, at Lamberton. So they've been conducting a planning date study all the way starting in 88 all the way through 2013. Um, one of these things that we've got to get done is get the data summarized from the last several years. And I, I want to be sure to tap into some of that newer data. Uh, but there's a couple of things that are really relevant here in this data that I think are important to, to note. Uh, first, you know, Jeff talked about percentage ma maximum yield in these studies. And, and this is actually shown with, with the basically the, the summarized data for each of these years. And so the way this looks, if we plot this out, you'll see that in each of these years, the highest yielding planting date would be considered at 100%. So if we plant these studies from April 10 through uh, July 20th, the date that gives us the highest yield is considered 100%, and the yields are, uh, all other yields are, are noted relative to that date. So an important thing to note is that we've got between 88 and 2013, you could see that individual planting dates uh, maximized yields all the way from early April all the way through almost the end of May. So there were years where we had planting dates in early April that were the highest planting, uh, yielding planting dates. And there were years where the highest yielding um, uh, planting date was actually at the, very, um, at the very end of May, almost into June. So another interesting thing I think that's really important to note here is, is how the data is spread over this period and, and what the kind of response looks like. 
So obviously we can get high yields in some years from planting early through late, but also look at the relative risk of planting early versus late. And I think what we end up seeing is that we have lots of high yields in this early, late April, early May period. The only difference is, is that we have a little bit more downside risk as we plant early into April. So the upside risk, I would say the upside risk is, uh, is equal across planting dates all the way through, um, uh, all the way through middle of May. The issue really is what what happens in some of those years? Early planting dates, we can see we have planting problems, as Jeff mentioned really clearly, emerge, emergence problems, crusting, um, imbibitional chilling, and a lot of other things can happen very early. And on the late side, we probably are in situations where we have the kind of year where we just run out of, uh, of heat units and run out of time to produce a high yield when we, when we put the plant, when we plant late. So I think uh, instead of talking about this as really a discrete uh, issue around a certain date will give us a certain um, uh, response in terms of, of, uh, of, a, um, of a yield response, I tend to think about this more around risk management. I think that's a lot of what farmers end up doing themselves anyway. By the time they utilize all this historical data and their own, um, from their own fields as well as, as, uh, as from agronomists, they kind of put this all together and are, are managing risk on their own farms and deciding how early is too early. You know, these kind of questions always come up like, is it better in the bag or in the soil, right? So this is really, this is where the rubber meets the road is, is when do we want to get in and get that seed planted uh, relative to, uh, to the planting, to the calendar date or the environmental conditions. And my overall feeling on soybean is really dr driven by what kind of conditions do we have in the soil? So what soil temperature, soil moisture level, and in putting in on top of that is, is the five to 10 day forecast. What, do, what does the weather look like going out? The problem with, with the future forecast on these things, uh, not only the fact that it's, it's, in, uh, it's not very precise, um, uh, the problem is, is we're dealing with two conflicting factors here. We're dealing with what the weather looks like down the road for that seed that's in the ground versus the weather that might impact working days going forward. And so there's, that's the real tension that I see among farmers is, is uh, that tough looking forecast, cold weather, cold wet weather coming. Uh, they'd like to get the seed in the ground. On the other hand, that also puts us at larger risk for having emergence problems. And I think ultimately that's probably the real, the real question that farmers face. And that's the one that's probably the most difficult for us to answer, um, uh, especially sitting here in, in my living room here in, in YZ. So um, I think let's turn it over, Dave. I think I've had enough uh, time, taken enough time. I think let's turn okay. it over and start ask, answering some questions and see if we can start a little dialogue. Here. All right. Then, uh, let me end my share. Thank you, Seth. All right, the first uh, first question is really a two-part question. It's actually for Jeff. And uh, this goes back to probably one of our, our, our things that we usually deal with from a lot of questions in growers every year. And that's about soil temperature. And Doug asked a question and in, in probably in two parts here. Uh, should 50 degrees still be considered a minimum temperature? And if you are going to take soil temperatures, uh, what would you suggest as a proper depth for taking soil temperatures to give you a better handle uh, when you're planting. So really two, two uh, things in there, Jeff, uh, from Doug as far as question uh, points. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, the 50 degrees still holds for germination of corn. However, it's really not realistic to wait for that in, in much of Minnesota. Um, you know, generally once we get towards the upper 40 degrees uh, soil temperature, and the, you know, the forecast looks like it's going to warm up, you know, just it's good to go, go ahead and plant. Uh, and especially that becomes true when we get towards the later part of April and one hasn't, uh, you know, made a lot of progress on planting, then it's, it's really prudent to just get it in uh, when the soil conditions are fit and with the assumption that the soil is going to warm up in the, in the near term as long as the, the forecast for the one to two days after planting is not looking like it's going to be near 40 degrees. Uh, with regards to the depth of soil temperature um, that we take the measurements, you know, if we can take a measurement down about four inches, that's going to be more stable than if we take a temperature near the soil surface. 
the, the upper part of the soil is really impacted uh, by what the air temperature is. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And the next question is actually, we're gonna flip it over to Seth here. Um, and actually, so Seth, if you're, you're on your game this morning, I'm gonna give you two questions right in a row, okay? All right, so the first one is, what's, what soil temperature uh, should we have for planting soybeans? The second question is, uh, should we consider in this day and age of planting a shorter season soybean first? In other words, a head of corn. And we've talked about that uh, prior to the call here today, you and I. Um, if that's a consideration, a lot of growers are looking at that. So should we consider that um, planting first ahead of, ahead of corn? The other question is what soil temperature uh, do you recommend for soybeans? And these are both from Doug. Yeah, I'll take the soil temperature one first. And I'm not a big believer in this uh, soil temperature measure. I don't think it's a very good indicator of um, soil conditions relative to planting. Um, soil temperature is really highly dependent on soil moisture levels. And that's really more impacted on working conditions. Um, so I, you know, once we dry out, soils warm up. Uh, we also have big wide fluctuations in soil temperature day to night. Um, how those are measured. Uh, so there's a lot of problems with, with soil moisture. I tend to really look at soil conditions and far, if farmers can get in and do a good job of planting um, uh, relative to soil moisture levels for those particular soils, I'm not really concerned, especially based on looking out at the 10 day forecast. If we've got warm weather coming, uh, even if the soils are cold, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing farmers out there to get out there. I'm also, there's a lot of discussion about imbibitional chilling out there and there are really real cases of this in soybean where it's very well documented, but they're very, very, very few. So I think the risk uh, relative to, um, to the, the problems uh, in directly related to imbibitional chilling itself, I think are relatively low. Let me, um, I'm gonna see if I can switch over here and share my screen. I've got a little, a couple slides here from uh, my lab and I worked with uh, Sean Connolly's lab. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my, um, uh, there we go. So, a couple of years ago, we did a, a planting date study uh, involved with another a number of different things in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, we looked at a number of different factors here in this study, but one of the things was was planting date. So this was 14, 15, and 16. We were in three locations in Wisconsin, as well as St. Paul. Uh, so the take home here, though, is is when we looked at common varieties across all these locations. Basically, we saw the same sort of a, of a curve that we would normally see. We see maximum soybean yields in this early May period. And then once we get out to June, things really drop off heavily. Uh, but this is the important factor here is, is when we look at the maturity dates, when we look at the longest maturity, we had a range of maturities at each location. When I separated out the longest maturity for each one of these, and so I would say these weren't overly long, but this was a group two uh, in, in St. Paul. And so these are full, definitely full season varieties. Uh, they were on the long side of our range. When we looked at the planting date response in full season soybeans, the downside risk at the end of the season, so that July 1 penalty was still right about 50, you have 50% 50 yield for long seasons versus short seasons. Uh, the difference between these two is the, is the upside uh, opportunity for early planting. So. Um, so I, this is a really important point I think farmers need to understand is that there's a lot of discussion out there about early planted soybeans. Uh, Sean Connolly in Wisconsin is really pushing this hard. It's really critical for farmers to understand that they, there's no, oper there's no uh, yield gains or there's not, a, there's not a large opportunity for yield gains if they're planting regular um, maturity varieties uh, that, that fit even really, really well into their environment. They really need, a farmer really needs to push that soybean maturity a little bit with that early planting in order to capture any yield gains. Especially if you're looking at a short season variety, if farmers are planting anything very short, there's no reason to rush to get those into the soil at all. Uh, we have very little difference in maturity dates 
uh, but the yield potential for those shorter varieties um, does not um, does not increase at all over a really broad range of, of planting needs. Okay. So I hope I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you, Seth. <clears throat> well, the next question is from Blake. It's kind of a toss-up question here, depending upon um, who wants to go first or give a try at this. Is it, what is your guy's opinion on spiked closing wheels? Um, can there be a negative with them? In other words, on the closing wheels, a spike closing wheel, is there a negative in using those on, in a planting situation? Jeff, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Well, what I've seen is that, you know, uh, with one spike closing wheel and another regular closing wheel, that can help uh, fracture sidewalls if it, the planting is done into fine textured soil where we're set up for sidewall compaction. On the other hand, um, you know, if we're not in a situation like that, uh, it could be affecting the seed to soil contact. So I think a key thing that we wanna see with whatever we're doing is that we're getting good seed to soil contact so that we can get quick imbibition of water into that seed so it can germinate and emerge quickly. And, um, you know, if the closing wheel is somehow inhibiting that anyway, uh, that could be a potential issue. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Jeff on, on the soybean side. I okay. The first the first big point here is that there's a lot of there's a wide range in these um, planting attachments for uh, finishing um, uh, at the planter, and it's because we have a wide range of of soil textures and and conditions out there. And I think farmers really need to find what works best with them. Buying rubber wheels off the off the shelf is going to work with a lot of them, um, but it's not going to work for everybody, and it's not going to work for all of your fields or all of the soils within fields. So you kind of have to split the difference and identify what works best in most locations. Um, I actually use that same combination on my research planner. I'm in a lot of different environments, and so sometimes it really works well for us because we're in some tough conditions. But I will say when we're in, in better conditions, as Jeff mentioned, uh, it's actually doing quite a bit of tillage there. And so when I'm digging seed, uh, I, my soil, my seed depth is not as precise in using that spiked, um, that spiked closer. And that's in soybean. So I'm, I'm only looking at, you know, three quarters of an inch or something. Uh, but the but the reality is it's doing it you can do a considerable amount of tillage there and you could actually lift some of those uh especially i think in a corn as well you could probably lift some of that corn out of a out of a opt optimum depth uh probably not as big of a problem in soybean but i could see how in corn you could actually change that planting depth and um we don't see any on the ground but certainly i think we are they're not they're definitely not laying nice and tight down uh, within that furrow for sure. So I guess two things, use what works, uh, but also it's a good reminder to get out of the cab and dig a lot of seed. Get get your father-in-law out there to follow you around the field uh, and dig seed after the planter. It's really, most, most springs, it's really easy just to hit the gas and go, um, but we have to continually throughout the day, throughout soil types and farm to farm, I think it's really important just to make sure we're, we're getting the right the right depth and spacing on all those units. Okay, uh, it is about nine o'clock. We are going to keep going though, um, because this is an important topic. Um, and I didn't indicate it earlier, but this is the last in our series here. So we wanna make sure there's ample time for questions coming in there. So if you can hang with us for at least a, another uh, 15 minutes or so, that'll be great. Uh, we had a question actually, uh, Jeff and Seth, that came in earlier. And you guys got the heads up on this uh, a couple of days ago. And that was a question about planting population. And as you well know, in Minnesota, uh, obviously besides uh, corn and soybeans, we have a lot of sugar beet growers. And the question came in with a lot of equipment that they have, and they're in 22 inch rows. What is your recommendation for plant population in 22 inch rows uh, that you would uh, prefer to look at? And we obviously have situations in Northwestern Minnesota as well as in Southern Minnesota. So who, who would like to take that first? Yeah, I could answer on the corn side. Uh, so for corn, it's pretty consistent, regardless of row width, that the optimum planting rate does not differ. In addition, the optimum planting rate is fairly consistent across the state, with whether you're in Northwest Minnesota or in Southern Minnesota. 
in most cases, about 80% of the time in medium to high yielding fields, the optimum planting rate is between about 34 to 36,000 seeds per acre. However, in about 20% of the cases that are medium to high yielding, the optimum planting rate is closer to 38 to 40,000 seeds per acre. That tends to be somewhat environment specific, high yield environments that don't have many limitations to, to growth. In addition, it also tends to be somewhat hybrid specific. So certain hybrids uh, have a higher optimum planting rate, but in general, 34 to 36,000, that's consistent regardless of row width and where you are in the state. Seth? And on the soybean side, I think just the row width by planning, uh, by seeding rate question, if we, if we just look at that specifically, uh, that's one of the big changes from when I came on board 20 years ago. There was a lot of, there was a huge range. Agronomists recommended big ranges in populations relative to row spacing. This idea was that, that narrow rows could, um, could utilize higher populations better and optimize yields. And so we were plant, you know, there was state recommendations that varied by 100,000 plants per acre based on row spacing. Uh, basically, when I and others have looked at this, we found that there's no interaction, meaning we don't get any more yield response in narrow rows versus wide rows. And when I dig into the data uh, and look at attrition in the soybean plants, what we're what I'm finding basically is that narrow rows, because the seed to seed distance or the plant to plant distance is greater in narrow rows at the same population, there's less competition, there's less attrition over the year. So at the same seeding rates, we end up with final plant stands in narrow rows versus wide rows at higher levels, okay? So there's quite a bit to unpack there. I'll just repeat that. Narrow rows allow us basically to have more higher final stands at any given seeding rate. And so therefore, that's probably why the, the, the seeding rate doesn't interact with row spacing in that we end up with uh, a little bit higher uh, final stands, which are really what drive the yields uh, for us in, in soybeans. So, we do not recommend any change in seeding rate uh, by, row sp by row spacing, uh, given a, a, the same type of planting equipment. Okay. We have a um, couple of folks that have raised their, uh, raised their hands here um, in, in terms of that and uh, opportunity uh, for that. We'll uh, probably, come back to them in just a second and, and so forth. So hang, hang in there. Uh, we're going to just take another couple of questions here. Uh, one has to do with planting depth for both corn and soybeans. This is from Tom. So you wanna talk a little bit more about that um, and what we have going, going forward, especially, you know, uh, we're a little bit unknown, maybe a little bit drier in some places and, and so forth, but you wanna comment on planting depth and your recommendations uh, uh, coming up here for April and May. Jeff, why don't you take that one first? Mine's easy. Okay. Uh, well, generally for corn, two inches is optimal in most situations. However, if it's very dry near the soil surface and you need to reach moisture, planting as deep as two and a half inches can be okay, as long as you're not planting early and the soil is warm. And soybean simple because we don't have this uh, depth requirement on soybean. We we can plant basically wherever you can to get good emergence. So you have to kind of work backwards through things for that. I'm actually a proponent of relatively um, shallow planting under most conditions. There are soils that seem to respond better under a little bit deeper conditions, uh, but we just need to get those out of the ground. So get down to the moisture or where we think we're going to have moisture in the next few days after planting. So for farmers that are planting in dry conditions this year, but there's there's a you know 100% chance of rain over the next few days, I have no problem uh, putting in those a little bit uh, more shallow. Uh, I'm not not concerned about that at all. Even a half inch uh, is is totally fine with me. Um, but again, um, you know, back to Jeff's comments earlier about seed to soil contact, that's really a critical piece of this. And as we move to higher planting soybeans after higher residue corns. Um, we really have to watch that we're getting those that soybean in in contact with soil and it's not around a, a bunch of corn residue. And so managing depth 
not only relative to the soil, but relative to the, the, the corn residue that's in that row is really, really critical. And so sometimes we actually, in the high residue soils, we actually have to go a little bit deeper to make sure, those units have to go a little bit deeper to make sure we're getting into um, uh, um, a substrate that's primarily soil and not just uh, a bunch of organic matter uh, from, from corn residue. Okay, um, let's just a situation, a question here. Um, the, if you're wondering about other, other questions and so forth, they're in the Q and A box as they come through. I'm going to call a quick audible here though. Uh, uh, Dean, Dr. Dean Melvick is with us. Dean, are you able to, uh, uh, turn on your camera, camera and perhaps participate? I have a question that is, is somewhat, per, uh, related to, uh, pathology here. And I don't know if you're, uh, uh, at that, at that point. Okay. Dr. Uh, Dean Melvick is our extension plant pathologist in corn and soybeans. And this actually is a question from Luke. And his question is, is there any correlation between soybean planting date and potential for white mold in a high risk environment? And then the second part is what about SDS or sudden death syndrome? Yes, for, for white mold, it's, it's a complex question there. A lot of variables come into uh, driving the risk for white mold, I think, as all of us have seen. But if you, I guess the, the most strongest association I would see, if we get a, something in early and it enables faster growth and more lush growth by the time it starts flowering, which of course there's lots of variables beyond planting date that control that, that could help make an environment that favors white mold. But other than that, I don't see a strong relationship between planting date and white mold. SDS is different. Um, it's not so much the soil temperature, but the soil moisture. If it's moisture, it enhances, typically enhances early season infection of that seedling. Um, uh, a number of studies have looked at the, the temperature effect. Is it more favored by cooler temperatures? That's not as clear, but the moisture component is, is definitely a strong one in terms of favoring early season infection by the fungus that causes SDS. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit back and forth, but Seth, the next question is actually from Susan here. Uh, and her question is, what can you tell us about light interception in soybeans and yield beyond the wisdom of closing the canopy by a certain growth stage? So it, Sounds a little, little bit more like a, uh, uh, a question that you would get in your prelims. There you go. Yeah, that's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, that's, that's kind of the, um, you know, we live in our discipline, we live on a lot of these old anecdotes. And I think that's a good one is that we want to have canopy closed by R1. It would be ideal. The problem is uh, that may work in um, Southern Iowa, uh, but it's certainly, we just don't, we can't get there as we move further north. Uh, we basically, I would say that between water um, limitations and light interception uh, in Minnesota, these both are equal contributors to uh, our yield limitations. So, um, you know, year to year variation when we run out of water, that really zaps our yields. But year over year, uh, so more consistently, our yields are really limited by the season length. And uh, so we just want, and the season length is really um, not only heat units, but it's also the amount of light intercepted. And there's some interactions at the early part of the season. But anyway, long story short, farmers just need to do whatever they can to collect as much light energy out there as they can. And that's why we have a yield advantage for narrow rows. We have a few more days with those long, uh, long day lengths early in the season where, where soybeans can uh, accumulate more light energy within that total canopy. So you could draw a pretty straight line between the amount of light energy captured by a soybean crop in Minnesota relative to its yield uh, at, the, at the end of the year. It's, it's a pretty straight line. So uh, do whatever we can. That's why early planting helps a little bit. But the challenge is with early planting, as farmers know, those soybeans just struggle and they don't do a lot for those first two or three weeks after emergence when it's really cool. So um, the, the planting date advantage is certainly not a one day to one day advantage. Okay. Uh, there's some information uh, Liz just put in our coworker on uh, corn planting information. There are excellent websites for both corn and soybean, uh, agronomic questions and production. 
authored by uh, Seth and Jeff that are online at the U of M Extension uh, websites. Uh, I have a question for on actually from Anonymous here, and you both can take a crack at this. Um, if you are planning on performing a secondary uh, tillage pass prior to planting, is there an advantage to doing so a couple of days prior to planting to allow the opportunity for the profile to become more uniform? And so let's talk about corn and soybeans as it relates to that. You want me to jump in? I'll, I'll jump Go ahead. in real quick. So, um, Go ahead. You know, I just, you know, from my own experience, and I don't, uh, I don't have anything beyond what anybody probably has from their own experiences. I do, I do appreciate um, getting a day or two in advance, not only for this directly related to this question about getting the soil moisture kind of equilibrate, but it also lets us know where that moisture level is, and it, it we're able to more precisely plant right into and on top of that moisture level when we do come back and plant. So I do agree that we can probably do a better job of planting. Um, but the other side of this is we mostly just need for that surface soil to dry out a little bit so we have better planting conditions. Those, um, you know, those gauge wheels uh, really need to run on dry soil on the top so that we don't have any problems and we get a little bit better furrow um, made in that when we, we mostly are going through that drier soil profile at the, at the very top of the soil. So I would say, yes, I, I totally agree with that if it's an opportunity, but we also understand that there's a lot of logistical challenges for farmers in the spring. Jeff, any other comments on that? No additional comments. Okay. Um, actually, the next question, uh, we all know that we obviously have crop insurance that plays into planning data, uh, uh, et cetera. So maybe this is kind of an academic question for you, Seth, in, in some regards, but we're going to uh, switch over and, and put on a hat and think about ultra early planting. Uh, so Bill's question is when pushing, you know, to ultra early planting date for soybeans, uh, we or their operation has some anecdotal information of late March slash early April beans placed at two inch or, or lower depth perform much better than normal depths. Can you discuss the effects of temperature slash moisture stability at depth? So maybe that's probably the, the question that really that needs to be answered. It is the effects of temperature slash moisture stability uh, at depth or is affected by depth. That's an awesome question. I, I really wish I had answers for that. I mean, I, that that's that's a real money question if um, uh, and we I'm actually going to do a lot of work with sensors this spring uh, across three tillages and drainage conditions uh, where we're going to we're going to really thoroughly analyze soil temperature and moisture at a two inch depth right at planting time to understand how those vary by those those treatments. But um, for ultra early, I, you know, honestly, the stability question is a good one, but it's very complicated. So yes, two inches is two plus inches when with late March planting is going to be very, very cold. Does that mean it's so cold that these we basically uh, put these into the uh, chiller um, and we, we hold them in a state so that we don't have um, we don't have any germination until the soil profile warms up enough that we have conditions would, that would allow that crop to emerge under good conditions. And I think that's probably likely um, planting very shallow very early will lead that soybean to really uh, think a little bit too up to up or um, be a little bit too um, uh, think things are too good coming up. Um, and uh, and I think the problem there is that we could have some uh, germination early and then have really tough conditions after that. So uh, I I, I would not recommend this practice, but I could understand how in theory this could potentially work out for folks. So um, there's a lot of risk on all sides of this question, but I, I really, really, really appreciate the question. Quick question for both Jeff and, and Seth, and that is you shared some slides and some data that's of interest to some of the audience members here. Anonymous asks, um, are they able to gain access to the data? I would assume some of the slides or information like that that you referenced today and where could they find that? Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I'd be happy to share the slides. So uh, anybody can just feel free to email me, Jeff Coulter, one word, at umn.edu. Seth? 
And that's probably the best way to share for me too, is just to contact me directly. I, it's, it's no problem. I'd be happy. And that way, that way, if folks contact Jeff or I, we can help explain some of the nuances. PowerPoint slides don't always, um, aren't always the whole picture without some context. So it'd be, it'd be probably ideal if we could, um, send those to you and answer some questions along the line. And so somebody a, put, kind of, make, make sure and put our emails in the chat, in the chat for us. Okay. We have a kind of an advanced question here for you, Seth. Uh, from anonymous is there any benefit to singulating soybean seeds better by using a seed disc with say 60 cell versus 108 cells that drops one seed at a time so a little on the plant planting process there i don't know if you have enough information to in that question well, or not I, I can't drill all the way down to the very specifics about 60 versus 108s and 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 planter types and speed and all those kind of things but uh, I would say in general, this is a really good, um, I think this is a really good um, bit of information for producers is that in soybean, the reality about singulation is about uh, minimum stands required and not about yield potential. So let me, let me unwind that a little bit. Um, what we found is when we have poor singulation that we tend to have more attrition again. So we have seed to seed or plant to plant competition we tend to lose one or two of those seeds that are planted on top of each other. If you have one, two or three seeds all together, if you have two, three seeds planted on top of each other, we tend to lose one or two of those. So the reality is um, yield potentials don't change, but if we're already looking at minimum or, or, or low seeding rates, then we could have problems. So in other words, one more way to state this, um, better singulation allows us to reduce seeding rates a little bit further than with poor seed distribution. If we have poor seed distribution, we have to <coughs> overseed to ensure that we have good stands to meet that minimum stand. Um, one of the last questions we have here is from Susan for both uh, Jeff and Seth, and is our VR planters paying for themselves given today's prices? So VR planters paying for themselves given today's prices. I think we're talking about more like in precision application, yeah. et cetera. I'll, here. I'll, go, I'll go first on this one, too, right. if you don't mind, Jeff. I'm, I've been doing some work on this. Um, I guess my flip answer to that, Susan, is that everything pays for itself at these prices. Um, but um, let's, let's back up a little bit. Uh, there's a huge opportunity here. I think it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. I'm speaking just on the soybean side, and Jeff can chime in on corn. Uh, the problem is, is we don't have good um, methods to develop our um, prescriptions. Uh, so a lot of folks are using some soil type or yield mapping stuff, and those are probably getting us partway there. Uh, the problem is, is those factors that um, affect the response to um, seeding rate or the minimum seeding rate in soybean are highly year dependent. So whether we have a dry year or a wet year and when that drought or when that extra water comes has a re is a really big player in terms of how that response is gonna, gonna play out. And then we've got things like white mold and stuff on the other side of this equation. So um, yes, we do know in soybean that lower yielding areas of the fields do respond to higher seeding rates, probably in contrast to corn. Um, and I think that's an important factor. But beyond that, um, the, the specificity of, of those prescriptions so far, I've not seen one that I would really bet on uh, uh, at this point. But we're, we are working on it right now. Jeff? Yeah, so for corn, um, you know, I'm, I like this new technology. I think it has a lot of great potential, especially if you have a field that is variable. Um, in terms of uh, topography, soil type, these kinds of things. Um, that being said, uh, you know, if one varies the planting rate by 3,000 seeds per acre, that's about $9 an, an acre for corn. So if, you, if you're able to control that, you could save maybe $9 an acre on maybe low, line, low yielding parts of the field where you back off a little bit on the yield potential. Um, on the other side of the thing, um, we don't have a great handle on where these, on, on specifically when corn responds to the, to the very high planting rates. Uh, so, you know, one, it, it makes sense to think that, you know, in higher yielding areas, one would push the planting rate higher, 
But that doesn't always work. Only about 20% of the time are we finding uh, that we get a yield response due to a, a planting rate of 38 to 40,000 seeds per acre in Minnesota and in, in Wisconsin. Um, so I think that that's a key thing. Another thing for corn is that, you know, it bear, the plant can somewhat adjust. If the population is a little on the lower side, we get a little bigger ears. On the other side, uh, if the, the population is too great, then we get a little more barrenness we get more pullback on the tips, that kind of thing. I think it definitely has potential um, and it's where we probably want to be going. If one is doing a variable rate planting or if you do have the capability, uh, if you have the capability, definitely use it. And I'm a big proponent of, you know, trying to put strips in fields or blocks with different planting rates and to compare them and make your own comparisons to see uh, in different zones of the field, are you getting a yield response to a higher population or could you go a little lower? So I, I think it's a really good tool to uh, prove to yourself what the optimum planting rate was in a, in a given year for a given field. And if you'd have enough fields in a couple of years, you can probably start to fine tune things a little bit and maybe save a little money in some areas and make a little more money in other parts of the field. But with the high commodity prices now, uh, like Seth indicated, whatever we can do to increase yield is likely going to pay. Okay, we got a couple of, just two last questions here left. <clears throat> this one actually is from Angie Peltier, a coworker in uh, a crops educator and extension located up at Crookston. And maybe Jeff, you could go first at this situation. And it circles back to the uh, map that I showed early on at the start of the program. Um, she indicates that we, folks in the Crookston and Northwestern Minnesota, are experiencing very dry conditions uh, as of late. Um, and they would be, you, in terms of your recommendations to address planting adjustments to better ensure seedling emergence and stand establishment in dry conditions. So, uh, Jeff, why don't you go first there? And, and Jeff, Seth, if you have any uh, closing comments, that would be good on that one too. Yeah, well, in, in these types of situations, we want to think about conserving moisture in the seed zone. So ways that we could conserve moisture would be to prepare the seed bed close to planting, avoid unnecessary tillage passes in the spring, avoid tillage deeper than is needed in the spring. Uh, another option would be to consider rolling baskets to try to seal in some soil moisture. And another option is if needed, one could plant a little deeper, say maybe two and a half inches for corn to reach soil moisture. And that can be okay as long as you're not planting early and the soils are warm. Yeah. You know, the only thing I'd add is just some real broad comments about this uh, drought versus uh, yield potentials. And uh, I get, a, I interact with international audiences a lot. And so they're asking lots of questions about this major drought and how it's going to affect our crop and things like that. And certainly there is a very, you know, there's variation from east to west in Minnesota in terms of our yield, our, our rainfall patterns through the season. But boy, uh, again, restating this from earlier is, is dry conditions are really our friend early in the season. It gives farmers a real opportunity to plant earlier and under better conditions. We tend to get good rainfall in, in uh, June and then we, but we really need it in August and September. So um, on the soybean side, so um, I would, I'm still very, very, very bullish on this, on this crop for this year. I think things look fantastic, except those areas that are really super dry on the very western side of the, the state where they're more dependent on, um, uh, on moisture for their yield potentials. Okay. Um, I have just a technical question. I don't know. Uh, Liz or Phyllis, if we have access to that raised hand or if, if Richard still is out there or not, but I haven't uh, heard anything back on, on that. Uh, I just basically have one uh, last question and that's from a good friend of mine, a coworker, Jared Goplin uh, out in Western Minnesota. He said, any thoughts on smart depth control or changing depth on the fly according to soil moisture? So a little bit more technical here, cutting edge. Uh, comments on those before we close out? Either Jeff I'll, or Seth. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Yeah. So yeah, 
you know, it's it's honestly, this is like a lot of things we're dealing with right now is that the t technology really allows us to do probably a little bit more than we probably even know what to do with. Um, and so this is a good one. I think this, there's a real opportunity for this, but we really, the problem is I think a lot of farmers use these tools as crutches so that they can plant more acres faster. And the reality is you have to check these things to make sure that they're working correctly. Uh, so we have to basically get out of, again, get out of the cab and do the ground truthing to make sure that those areas that were, that are indicated as deeper or shallower, we're getting the right range and we're in the right spot because there's an opportunity for things to go not only not better, but, but worse for us. And so we definitely don't want to cause ourselves any problems with these things. So that's my biggest concern is that we want to make sure that these things are set up and that we maintain um, maintain them uh, through the season and that things that continue to work right. Well, thank you um, both Seth and, and Jeff. And certainly as we close out the program this morning, if folks have other questions for you, they can email you directly uh, in terms of those opportunity with those. Um, and that's all I have in, in the Q&A box at this point in time, uh, but as we go forward. So uh, we will be having a very short three question survey uh, when you leave the session today. So if you could just take a minute to fill that out, that would be great. Uh, we are going to send out a comprehensive season long eval here in the next couple of days, uh, quite soon. Uh, and that will be an opportunity to give us feedback because we've been doing this uh, you know, since the first of the year and we have a good opportunity for that. We are making plans for a version of this, this spring and summer. So we will let you know uh, about that and tentatively looking at, at Wednesdays for that uh, particular program to launch early in the morning. And that'll be uh, uh, just in time information about current farming that and agriculture production that's going on uh, with that. We'd like to thank today's sponsors uh, for helping us with not only today, but for the entire season of, of uh, programs of so the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, and also the Minnesota Corn uh, Research and Promotion uh, Council. So again, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, send us your uh, 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 feedback um, that is in, in, in terms of that. Uh, if you didn't get all of your questions um, answered, uh, please indicate that. Send it to one of us as the hosts. Um, all, we'll relay that back to uh, uh, Dr. Coulter or Dr. Nave, and you might be uh, getting a, an opportunity for a private exchange uh, along with that. So uh, Jeff or Seth, any other clothing comments? Uh, we're approaching 9.30 here. Again, thanks again. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time. And we will be getting uh, back to you a little bit more in, in information about our programming for this uh, uh, late spring and summer opportunities with that. So again, thank you. This is Dave Nikolai with the University of Minnesota Extension. And uh, we appreciate your attendance today. Thank you. Say, Dave, as you shut it down, Doug has a question, so I will let him talk here. All right, okay. fine. That's good. I think. Okay, you're, okay. you're going to let me, you're gonna <laughs> let me talk? We're going to let you talk, Doug. Oh, boy. <laughs> so you are on. Um, Seth, and maybe I missed the answer to this. I was wondering, do you feel that planting the full season soybeans first is better or is it better to plant the shorter season soybeans first to, in order to spread out harvest especially the you know the soybeans getting too dry before you get them harvested yeah that's a that's a really good question i guess just from the pure yield potential standpoint plant your earliest or your longest sorry plant your longest maturity varieties first they're the ones that can take advantage of an early planting now if you're you know, if you're kind of in a conservative zone and you're not really pushing maturities, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, and I guess I also, you know, the logistics of things really drive decision making. So if you've got issues around getting manure out there or other things, then those definitely are the drivers for these kind of things. Um, Moisture content is really a major problem in soybean is it's easy to get these soybeans too dry in the fall. And so um, I'm with you on that. And I guess this just happens, has to be kind of a management and farm by farm um, situation where you just have to kind of feel your way through this. 
Um, remember that soybeans don't really mature that much different um, from one another by maturity. Uh, basically, we've got maturity dates, you know, that, that are driven by late season conditions pretty hard. And so we don't change that very much. So um, you might get a day or two. Uh, but the yield potentials on short season varieties are much lo are much lower. So um, as long as you're in kind of a of a of an adapted maturity, and then if you have an opportunity to plant very early, then you push it a little bit. Uh, I would say I would say you're fine. But I I do ag agree that there is some challenges in trying to manage harvest conditions, but. I don't really have any really good con really good recommendations by that because I'm afraid that if you really change maturities to allow a real big spread, this opens you up for yield losses for those real short season ones. Does it does it make sense to put fungicide only on the longer season ones to try and spread out that moisture? I would say that um, moisture content, or I mean, I'm sorry, fungicide on soybean we in theory, those early season ones should respond, get a little bit better response. So you should get more, a better ROI, if you would, on those early ones. But we don't have a lot of data that really drives, shows this. So um, uh, I would, um, you know, I guess if you're going to split your fungicides, definitely do it on the earliest ones that you plant. If you're not going to treat everything, I would go with the earlies. Um, but know that it's probably, that you're going to have a hard time determining which ones got the fungicide and which ones didn't. Okay, well, thank you. You can ignore my email then. I sent you an email, but uh, with the same question. So. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Um, otherwise, I think, folks, that's that's it. Um, so Jeff and Seth, thank you again. Appreciate that. I want to thank Phyllis Bongard specifically for being the driving force and getting this all up and working in the host without her, this would not be possible. So thanks again to that. And yeah, oh yeah, Liz, thank you too. <laughs>